we're creating XAF applications, and then we'll come back to me after that, and I'll go into uh, some more detail on features that work well, coders features that work well in XAF projects and in um, and in other projects uh, that have a lot of code in them. Um, so, uh, so Code Rush, what is it? Well, it sits inside a Visual Studio, and uh, it in and it helps you write code faster. Uh, navigate the code faster and, and understand and see complex code uh, more quickly. Uh, with it, you get a toolbar up here that uh, that shows you the um, uh, that with different options that you can turn on and off. For example, I just turned on structural highlighting, which as we start writing code, you'll see uh, little lines appearing between braces that are connected. Um, there's the coder's training window right here, which gives you example keys that you can press. For example, here, this feature alt left goes to uh, camo case left. If I hit that key, uh, you'll see the carrot will move, and we'll get this little window will come up that says, here's what just happened, and we can click OK if we want to uh, keep that each other. Here's camel case right. So we'll say that and always do that there as well. So there you go. You can see what that does. And so camel case navigation gets you in between those uppercase, lowercase characters. Um, there's also tools for, uh, for working with selection. So if you want to increase the selection, you can increase the selection by logical blocks this, and you can also decrease the selection as well. Now, just this is a fresh install of Coder, so the first time I use features, we're going to see this window. Every time I use a feature for the first time, you'll see that, and it'll just ask me, do you want to um, use that feature or not? And um, in addition to selection tools, we also have uh, features for writing code quickly. Uh, for example, uh, if I wanted to create a try-catch block, I can type in TC here, like that for try-catch. And then I can hit the space bar to expand that template out. And there's the expansion. And this red arrow right here that shows up, the, the, it indicates the template was expanding. If we do that a few times, try catch, and one more time, try catch, we stop seeing the arrow. So the arrow stops showing up. After we use a feature for, several times, we stop seeing the arrow. Also, you can see there's the uh, structural, structural highlighting showing up there. Um, this is a marker left by CodeRush. I can just hit Escape to get down inside that marker and start writing code. Uh, again, the arrows show up, but they show up only the first few times that you use a feature. And there's that last one right there. So um, in addition to uh, these features, we also have uh, features for uh, refactoring. And so for example, we can come up here uh, to uh, class. We can hit the CodeRush refactor key, and we can choose for example, rename, and then we can do a, a, a rename across uh, all uh, across this type across the entire solution. Um, it's a very fast rename. It's faster than Visual Studios, um, so you have that that feature as well. Um, and and I guess I'll I'll stop there, Gary, and I'll and I'll switch over to you. Uh, just 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 ending with saying that this is just the the tip of the iceberg with regard to what CodeRush can do. And Gary is going to show you more specifics. Of uh, of that um, with regard to XAF, so I'm switching over to you now, Gary. Okay. Um. I mean, that's a bit odd. Why can I not bring up my? There we go. I love that background. All right, so Gary. that's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> It's okay, awesome. you weren't supposed to see that, but for some reason, the my uh, Visual Studio had decided it was going to minimize itself. Okay, so what I have here is a small application that will demonstrate how CodeRush and um, XAF together can make you more productive as a developer. So XAF speeds up the long-winded parts of software development, whilst uh, CodeRush will speed up the long-winded parts of XAF development. Not that there are very many of those, but I'll talk you through them as we as we come to them. So because this is the last webinar that I'm going to do before Christmas, I thought we'd keep a Christmassy theme and um, we'd write an application to help Santa manage all the presents and children and letters and things like that that he's going to get. So I've got up here a solution which I've called the Christmas Management System because as we all know the world needs another CMS system. Um, into, this app, into this solution I've already added um, the important classes which are um, child, letter and present. So we'll start with child. Um, because obviously Christmas is all about children and not all about Rachel Holly, as she would tell you. So if we start with child, um, let's, let's define this class out a little bit. And of course, the first thing that a child needs is, um, is, is a name, which, which will be a string. 
Now under code rush normally, if you wanted a property of type string, you would hit P for property, S for string, and press um, space, and you would get that. Because we're in XAF, um, it's almost identical, but what we'll do is we do X PS instead of um, just PS. So we've got X for S XAF, and when we hit the space bar this time, you can see the template is almost identical. I'll just fill it out with name, and you can see it works in exactly the same way. And the only real difference is this set property value part here. And that's an XAF specific um, method call there, which um, actually helps you with change notification. So that's what that, that's there for. So we'll go and um, add some more properties. So the child also needs an address because Santa needs to know where to deliver the presents to, and that will be a string as well. So again, it's XPS space, and we can do address. The next thing we need to know is um, a date of birth. So we do X D8 for a date. I did not do that right. That's what I get for taking my eye off the keyboard. Oh, XP D8. I missed out the P. Yep, yeah, I missed out the P for property. That's what it was. So I need XP date. So there we go. Date of birth. So that X template that you expanded is for creating exception descendants. And, uh, awesome. And so that, that's what you just saw expand. So <laughs> that's a big one. OK, and the next one we, we um, want to do, the next, the next property we're going to add is one that's very important for Santa. It's probably the most important one. So what we want is an XAF property of type Boolean, which will actually tell us whether or not that the child um, left out milk and cookies last year. Because obviously, if you didn't do that, then you're not going to get such a good present this year. Now that we've um, now that we've added all of the sort of simple and straightforward properties, um, we're going to look at something a little bit more complex where um, Code Rush can help us out. So one of the things that we're going to add is um, a gender um, for our child. Now we don't have a gender class or anything like that set up, um, so we're going to get um, Code Rush to help us out here. So the first thing we're going to do is hit XP. O, which will give us an XF property of type object. We hit space there, and we'll say this is um, going to be the gender of the child. So doing that, we can then go back to the object and overwrite that and say, I want to I want to create a gender here. Then when it's done, we can just open up um, Code Rush and say, let's declare an enum here. Code Rush will take us to the top of the uh, namespace there, and we can put in that's going to be male or female. And then we can hit escape to um, pick up the marker that we dropped. So that's the first one we need to do. And the next one on, the, on a similar kind of note is we need to know um, what list the child is on, whether on the naughty or nice list. So we can do XPO again. Again, create list. Go back onto object. Make that a list. And then we can get um, Code Rush to help us declare an enum again. And here, of course, it's going to be naughty or nice. All right, now we've done that, what we want to do is um, our solution, we've already said our solution is going to be composed of a child object, letter object, and a present object. So now it's time to actually um, join these up and um, see how we're going to use them in our solution. So the first thing we're going to say is that a child is going to write, over the course of his childhood, a child is going to write a number of letters to Santa. So what we actually need at this point is an XAF property of type collection. So we expand that template. And here what we've got is we're going to have letters. And they are going to be of type letter. thing to notice here that we've not seen before is this uh, association attribute here. Um, the only real thing to worry yourself about here is that there are, there are two ends to an association. There's the parent end and the child end. Um, and this text here, this child letters in this particular case, has to be the same at both ends, otherwise you'll get an error. So that's the only thing to watch out for. So now that we've set up letters here, the other thing that we need to do from the child's point of view is, again, over the course of the child, of the childhood, um, the child is going to get a number of presents from Santa. So again, we need an XAF property of type collection. And this is going to be presents. That's going to be of type 
present. Okay, and again, note the association attribute here. And with that done, we're pretty much finished in the child class now. So the next thing we need to do is to jump into the present class and create some attributes there. Now the first one to do, and mainly I do this first be is before I forget how to do it, or I forget that I have to do it, is that a present is going to be given to a child. And this is the other end of the association that we're talking about. So what we've got here is we want an XAF property of type attribute. So we expand that template, and this is going to be um, a child, and it's going to be of type child. And we see here that this association has the same text as it did in the um, in the child class. All right, so now that we've completed the other end of that association, what we're going to do now is to add in the other attributes for present. And so first of all, we need name, the name of a present. So we can do um, XAF property type string, and we can get name. And the other one is we'll do um, a delivery date so that Santa can keep track of um, what year he delivered what presents to the children. So we do um, an XAF property of type date, and we can do delivery date. And that's really all we're going to do inside the present. So we're finished there. Move on to the letter. Same with the present thing we're going to do first is to add the other end of the association before we, we forget. So a letter is always sent to Santa by a child. So let's add that. That is going to be an XAF property of type attribute. Expand that template. Again, this is going to be the child. It's going to be of type child. And again, we can see this association has the same text as the other end of the association, which is what we need. OK, let's finish up with the, um, the letter now. So inside each letter to Santa, the child will want something. So that will be a string. So we can do XAF property of type string and say this is what the child wants. And Santa might want to keep track of when he actually received the letter. So if we do an, an XAF property of type date again and say this is the date received. And that is pretty much all that we need to track really in our application. So let's go ahead and have a look at this application now. Hit F5 to launch it. I'll just move this in the center of the screen so you can see it. So here's our application that, that we've, we've had XAF basically create for us. Sorry, Mark, could you repeat that? I missed it. Gary, I, I just wanted to ask you a question. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to know about the, the date time received. So, I, you know, I, I'm familiar with XAF, and I know that when we run this, we're going to see uh, there's going to be some UI that's going to be associated with this field, date time received, right? So we can specify right. that in a form somewhere. But I'm wondering if it makes sense to automatically set that somewhere. And I guess my question to you is, is you know, is that, is, is, does that make sense within the context of your demo to set this automatically you know, just in response to the letter actually being received? Um, we, we could do. I mean, I guess if we were, if we were doing a, a, a proper demonstration of, of XEF or, you know, if this was a, a real live application, you might want to have it set to today's date, for example, or something like that, which it will, as, as we go on and we'll have a look, you'll see when we open up the um, the editor, it will actually default to today's date, although the property won't be set to today's date. Um, it, it's a it's a, a bit of a distinction, and I'll show you that when, when we get to that point. But yeah, certainly, I mean, if we wanted the actual property to default to today's date, we could we could set that up in, in setup code and, and things of that nature. But um, we'll go ahead and have a look um, at the child uh, sorry, at this application that we've um, we've created. So if we create this application now, there we go. And um, you can see XAF allows us to actually concentrate on the just on the entities. So all we really did was we concentrated on the entities that that 
were composed together to make our application. And XAF has actually um, scaffolded this nice UI for us. Um, and we haven't had to do any work for this. So this is where XAF really speeds your um, development process. So here, if the child's name, let's see who's the most childish person I know. Oh, Rachel Holly. Rachel Holly, there we go. Address, she's in the UK. Her date of birth, oh, 1st of April, we'll see. Um, whoops, let's see if I can, um, not quite that old. Uh, oh, behave yourself. 1982. There we go. Did you leave milk and cookies out for Santa last year, Rachel? Silence. Well, we'll go ahead I, and say I that. I might have done. <laughs> you might have done. Well, well, we'll we'll be kind and we'll say that you did leave out milk and cookies for Santa because obviously you won't get such a good present this year if you didn't leave milk and cookies last year. Um, Rachel is female and let's put her on the nice list, I guess, instead of the naughty list. So that's um, Rachel created. Let's um, let's go ahead and add letter to Santa. So here we go. Here's the UI that we created. That's been created for the letter. It's already filled in with Rachel because XAF knows that although we haven't actually saved or, or persisted that information yet to a database, XAF knows that we're actually working within that child, and so it's pre-populated this with Rachel Holly. And I happen to know that Rachel wants a VW. Beetle for Christmas, and let's say that she received the Santa received um, her letter today. So that's fine. Let's save and close that. So that's you sent your letter for a V for a VW Beetle to Santa Rachel, and then if we click on the presents tab here, we can add a new one, and we can say, well, Rachel Holly again. Whoops, once a VW Beetle. And the delivery date, provided she continues to be a good girl, will be on the 25th of December. Obviously, the delivery date will be on the same date every year, but obviously Santa needs to know the year because you wouldn't want to get the same present two years running, would you? Okay, so let's save and close that. And that's us done. Save and close that down. And we can see here's the, um, here's the record that we just created. And that's basically all that I wanted to, to demonstrate there to you. You can see how some parts of XAF um, development is a little bit long-winded because XAF gives you some built-in help with regard to associations and also with regard to change notification. And you would normally have to write that out in longhand, which might take you a little bit uh, longer than normal. But CodeRush there will help you with these templates that, that basically will write down the boilerplate code for you. Okay, and that's my demonstration of how um, CodeRush works well with XAF. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to return you back to um, Mark now, and hopefully he won't have any more problems with his sound. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm. I am back here, uh, guys. Uh, and you are not on the presenter list, Mark. So I can't. I think I just took me. I I did it before oh, you. Before <laughs> you you were too. You were too quick for me there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, so it's you know just trying to keep everybody on their toes. Yeah, I found out the problem. I, I had um, I, I'm pretty sure I know what the problem was with my sound. One of my uh, other programs running was running at about 50 percent of CPU cycles, along with Virtual BC, which was taking 40 something percent. And I think that as soon as I killed the one that was taking 50 percent, everything everything became clear all of a sudden, and I could hear. So. So I think that was a problem. So Gary, uh, yeah, thank you very much. I just want to—I'm looking to see uh, if there are any questions out there. It looks like all the questions have been answered, um, and uh, and so what I'll do now is I'll just—I'll show some, some more coders features uh, that that are are really helpful. So if you're just starting to learn coders for the first time with XAF, um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction into those features and. Uh, and and also, um, I, I I'll point out to uh, to other webinars that we that we're doing in the future, and also have already done. There's an introduction to coders webinar that we did I think a week ago, and I and I'm not sure if that's up yet or not in the in the published list of webinars. But if it's not, I'll make sure it's up in the next couple of days. And that's about an hour and a half long introduction to CodeRush. So uh, it's going to be deeper than what I'm going to give you in the next couple of seconds or a couple of minutes rather. Um, and we're, we've got about another 20 webinars scheduled every Tuesday. Uh, it's going to be it's going to start about two hours later than this one started. Uh, so it's 12 noon Pacific time uh, every Tuesday, and uh, we will do a different webinar on Code Rush. And so if you're interested in learning more about Code Rush, 
uh, and uh, becoming, uh, uh, becoming more of an expert uh, uh, using the product and becoming more productive. Um, we've got lots of content for you uh, lined up. So, uh, so definitely uh, check those out. Um, okay, so with that said, I will show my favorite navigation feature in CodeRush. It is called Tap to Next Reference. And uh, it's, the way it works is simple. You put the, the, the flashing cursor I beam here that we've seen in the, in the, on the word list here. You put that inside of an identifier, and then you hit the tab key. And then it simply takes you to the next reference in the source code. And you can hit the tab again and continue to hit it until you end up fully cycling around through all your references. Uh, this, this is using the, uh, the, uh, the same engine that, re that Rename uses. And so it's, it's, it's very fast. Um, <laughs> so I like tab to next reference. Another navigation feature is called Quick Nav, and that allows Mark, you to quickly net. Oh, yes, my dear. Sorry to interrupt. Just before you get started on that, um, Jake has asked, um, would it be possible for uh, somebody to direct him towards a uh, complete list of XAF shortcuts if such a thing should exist? Yes, I can. I, you can. You can find all the uh, the templates for XAF inside the DevExpress Options dialog, and inside here in the. Uh, uh, let me expand this out a bit. So on the left over here are all the options pages. Inside the editor folder, there's an options page called templates, and that's the one we're on. And if we go inside here. There's a folder called DevX, and inside DevX, there's a folder called XPO, and inside here are the templates that you saw Gary use. So we have XPCL, XPA, and then these two, which are kind of interesting, XP followed by this funky thing here, word called type in question marks, and here again, XR as well, um, the, the same thing. What we can do is I'll show you what that type is. Um, uh, when we get down into the, um, uh, when we get in the code, and we can try these out. And then you also have the XC uh, template here as well. Let's look at those. So XP followed by type. We saw that first. So let me put that in comments. XP question mark type question mark. So what this means when it has the word type inside the template name is that it's going to be XP followed by a shortcut for the actual type. So, for example, when Gary started, he typed in PS to just show you the code rush, built-in code rush template uh, to create a property of type string. And there's the preview over there in the, in the, uh, in the uh, training window. So P followed by S will give you a string. P followed by any of these shortcuts right here, like D8 will give you a D time. We saw that. And we saw Gary use also use the letter B to create a Boolean. So these shortcuts right here are, are available to you um, to, to use as a follow-up for that. So if we come in here and we type in, for example, XPB, that is a variation. We, we are actually expanding this template, but we're using B for Boolean inside, and that just saves us the time of having to, having to type in Boolean. So that complete list is actually uh, dynamic because I can come in here, for example, on child, and I can right-click on child, and I can say, use type in templates. And I can, I can, I can use, for example, ch as a, as a mnemonic for that child. And now that I've done that, I can come down here, and I can use that XP template now, followed by ch, and now we get a, uh, a property of type uh, child. I mean, there you go. So property of type child. And we can specify the name, whatever that's going to be. Something along those lines. Okay? So, so you can add your own, your own types to that list. And so the list, so the question, can I get a complete list? Well, you can't really get a complete list because it's super dynamic. But the essence of, the, of what you need to know is inside that options page in that folder. And it's, the, um, it's those pieces that Gary talked about. You know, the other thing, too, that we can do is we can create a uh, blog post about this that actually gets these to you in text so you don't have to bring up this dialogue and see these. 
So the other one, I don't think Gary showed this, is the XC template for um, for creating a. Uh, I didn't, answers. Mark. So, yes. Sorry for jumping in there. I didn't. Dem I didn't show that one because the XC is for creating an XPO class. It's actually an XPO only um, template, so, and it doesn't doesn't function within XCF. Gotcha. Okay. And so, and the other one was the XR um, type. I don't think you, you showed this one either. And and I just want to look uh, at this. I didn't. No. So you see if this looks interesting at, at all. This is um, so. This is going to create a, a it looks like a it's setter method, one. is what it is. Yeah. Yeah, and then, oh, I see, there we go. Yeah, I see, it's a read-only property. Okay, so we can look at that, too. So we'll do, like, an XRB, for example, create a read-only uh, Boolean property. There's the window for the first time I expand that template. And then we'll give it a name, like, uh, um, is happy. Like that. And we get code that looks something like that. So, okay, so we can do a blog post on this, uh, uh, either Gary or I can. We'll work that out um, uh, and, and try to get up that up tomorrow and get a list of these to answer your question, Jake, to give you that list, okay? And Mark, is it, yeah. sorry for interrupting, and I've just realized I actually missed a bit of my demo that, that maybe you can, um, maybe you could actually demonstrate now. What I did was when I created those, the gender and the list um, enums, of course, that polluted the child class or the child file with those. And what I actually meant to do was then use um, Code Rush to push those um, out to, f to files on their own. And I've actually forgot to do that step. Could you maybe um, demonstrate that now? Because obviously, it's quite important not to leave the um, class file polluted like that. So you want you want chi you want the gender property outside well, of child? Is that right? Yeah, that's already it's already done, you know, in the version that you've got. But if you just create an enum, any old enum in that file there, and what I actually meant to do was then because we, oh, I see. So I'm sure. we want them, we want to keep our code as tidy as possible. And we don't want it polluted. So if you could just create any old enum there and just demonstrate um, the ability to push um, that enum out of the file into sure. its own file, that'd be great. Uh, sure, I'll that. do that. So okay, so so actually, while Gary was suggesting that, I actually used some Code Rush features to grab that enum and bring it back in. So I used tab to next reference to get to it. I used a feature called Smart Cut, uh, and Smart Cut is allows you to cut something to the clipboard without having to select it first. So for example, if I'm here and I hit the Control X to cut, it will take that whole declaration and put it on the clipboard. By the way, if I bring up the clipboard history, um, the shortcut for that is Control plus Shift plus insert. <clears throat> By the way, we're gonna. There's a Code Rush webinar coming up on using Code Rush with the clipboard. But if I bring up that, you can see there it is on the history. Nothing else has been copied to the clipboard yet in this session, but that one is there in the history right there. So, at any rate, so this is what Gary was talking about. He's got gender here inside of this namespace uh, inside the file child, but we really want to move it out. And so we put the carrot there. We put hit the uh, Code Rush refactor key. And because only one refactoring is available, it simply moves it right on out of that of that file. We can now hit escape to come back, and now we're back to where we started. So I think Gary also alluded to that in his demo. He at one point, I think, did a refactor. Oh, he declared a class, and then he hit escape to come back. Uh, uh, or, or I think he declared the enum, rather, and he had escaped to come back. And that is a consistent thing that happens all the time in Code Rush. So if you are working somewhere and you execute a feature that moves you to another location in your solution, you can press escape to get back to where you were working. And that's what we just did. So all right, so I demonstrated that. And um, I'm seeing all of, these, uh, all of these strings in here. So let me show you a couple things that you can do with strings. But this is a lot of features for strings. And, and, and you know, it, it's, I, I guess I should just underscore that anything you see here is a small portion of what is inside the product. The product is, 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 is really huge with regards to what its capabilities are. Um, the cool thing is, is that access to most of the power is, is consistent. It's essentially um, uh, uh, you get one key to bring up a menu of refactorings and uh, code providers. Uh, refactorings will, are, are, are uh, little wizards that will change the, the uh, code but will not change behavior. And code providers are things that might change behavior uh, uh, or might fix broken code. So uh, if I hit the code rush refactor key here, for example, I can come in and say, let's introduce a constant for this. And now I've introduced a constant. That green box around it means I can edit that. I can also hit the tab key to go see its declaration. And I've done it that easily. 
um, if I let's call another method here, like uh, for example, log. Oops, that was IntelliSense that uh, kicked in there. Uh, so I'm going to say log, and I'll say uh, greetings, Getty. Is that how you spell your name? No, it's, it's something. That's like how that. Ray spells and, it. Yeah. And so um, this is a real easy feature, but you use it all the time. It's a, it's simple. It's it's a small savings, but it's something I use all the time. If my carrot is here before the close brand, I hit the semicolon, it gets me out. Um, in fact, let's cut that to the clipboard. Let's come back up here. Let's create a new method. So I can use M for creating new methods and just hit the space bar like that. And there's I'm expanding that that out. And uh, we'll call this um, uh, uh, accessing presence like this for example and and then we'll come in here and we'll paste that in that log greetings Getty let's actually call it from here and pass it and just semicolon there like that and so we have a call to a method that doesn't exist yet we can declare it by hitting the code or factor key and this is the target picker it allows us to select where we want to put that new log method I'll put it right there and we'll I call this message and and I think I'm okay with that. We'll add some code here. We would add code here later. Sometimes when you have a parameter, you want to declare a, a field to hold on to that value. And you can do that very easily. Hit the code rush refactor key. Here are the refactorings. And here are the code providers. We can choose declare a field with initializer. And now it's declared a, a field there called MSG. By the way, if, you're, if your uh, settings for your fields don't match this, you can change these inside the code rush options. So I originally started by saying let's show you what you can do with strings. So one of the things you can do with strings is if you select a portion of a string, you can split that string into three pieces. As you can see in the preview hint right there for split string. I can also put the carrot just at a particular location and I can split the string in two like that. So you can do that. Um, another thing I can do is I can introduce a format item here, and now I've got to call it a string dot format, and then here I can hit the same code or factor key again, and I can choose, for example, promote to parameter, and now we can call this uh, we can call this name, for example, for example. So um, so code Rush has templates. It has uh, features for navigating through the code. Um, one of them is quick nav. Um, I'll show you that. Uh, I bring this up by hitting Control Shift Q, and it gives me a list of all of the uh, uh, symbols that are in scope from where I'm from where I am based on the settings here. So right now I have a current solution selected, uh, and I have all of the the accesses, uh, all the visibility access um, buttons down, and all of the member types as well. So I'm seeing everything. Uh, if I want to filter, for example, say I'm somewhere else. Let's let's go actually somewhere else. And let's say I want to find get back. In fact, we'll go over here in the list. Um, let's say I'm in list and I want to go find that accessing presence method. So I can hit Control Shift Q to bring that up. Type in AP like that, and now you can see what I'm what is in the list. Accessing presence is up near the top. If I'm not sure about that, I can uh, hold down the Control key and get a preview of it. Um, it, that's handy if there are, are multiple methods called accessing presence. Say I've got overloads. Um, I can also show the type if I want to to actually see the type of each piece in here. If that's interesting to me, you might click that and show type. So that's quick nav and uh, and it, once and, it, and just like all the other features in CodeRush, when I use a feature that takes me for, away from where I start, I can hit escape to get back. Okay. So we have templates for creating code quickly. Um, you've got the training window off to the side. You have selection uh, uh, tools for, for increasing selection, for moving through uh, camel case letters in an identifier. Uh, um, uh, we have uh, navigation and we have uh, consume first declaration features. For example, where I had this call to log and then I turned it into a method called log starting at the call. Right, so consume first declaration features. So um, there's a lot in Code Rush that's designed to help you move in, in, and uh, write code quickly. Um, the last thing I'm going to talk about here before we end this and answer any questions is I want to go into the tool windows and just talk a little bit about the tool windows that we have available. 
Uh, one of them is, is code issues, and uh, we'll bring that up. And code issues shows you the issues inside of your solution where there might be um, problems. For example, I might say uh, my var equals a new child, for example, like that. And uh, and let's see, I may actually have um, code issues turned off. The code issues turned off. Um, let's turn it on here. All right, here we go. And so what happens is, so we originally we saw Visual Studio's uh, uh, code issues coming up. Um, now we have uh, code rushes as well. And so here you can see they're showing up here and here and here as well. What's nice about these is I can just do a fix immediately right there. I can say, for example, uh, declare local, and there it makes the fix for me. So that's what code issues is going to do for me. And it uh, looks like I need to pass in a session object there. That's why we're getting the, the, uh, that piece of it. I'll say no, or I'll say OK on that, because I expanded the end template to, to do null. Speaking of which, there's also uh, t for true as well. And by the way, if you get tired of seeing these, if you just want to say, you know what, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm down with the way CodeRush is working, uh, I'll show you how you can turn those off, turn off these features that are, that are uh, coming up here. That's going to be in the hinting. And well, actually, there's two places, actually. One of them is action hints, and these are the arrows that pop up that you see in the code. And you can disable those there. That's one of those, those pieces. Um, the other one is is going to be on uh, is in uh, is in features under core, and it's this show feature UI window, and so we can just clear that off right there, and so now we won't see that UI window popping up anymore uh, whenever we do a new feature. Um, okay, so we've got the code issues window, which you're seeing right here. Here is another example. Implicit variable can be used, so for example. So what we can do is we can if we want to you to, to go with that, we can we can hover over that that issue. Hold on. Well, let's hit the code rush for factor key instead. I'm, I'm not sure why that's not showing up there. Make it implicit. That's what I'm looking for. All right, so we can do a make implicit call right there, and there the issue goes away. Um, we can also, if you want to do instead, let me undo that again. We'll bring that issue back again, where it's it's. I'm going to keep I'm clicking this. There we go. Maybe, there we go. So implicit variable can be used. So when you hover over it, you'll see this issue. So you can actually click make implicit there to correct it. Or if you never want to see it again, you can click on this and you can say, for example, let's always disable this so I don't ever see that issue again. So we can suppress that issue like that. Um, and then and then we see the last one issue is there's unused declaration. So that's the code issue window. Uh, there's the code rush training window, which we saw a little bit of, of to begin with. Uh, there is the user guide. The metric shows you metrics in the code. Open files gives you a list of open files. The plugin manager is useful if you're consuming any third-party plugins and you want to uh, uh, and you want to manage whether those are loaded or not. And also, if you're writing your own plugins, it's useful. And the uh, uh, the references gives you a find all references. And one of the things I like about this is the live sync ability for it. So as I actually move into a member that's in the code, it'll find all of the references to that particular um, that particular entity. So here, for example, I'm on on the word child, and it's now just showing me all references. So it's this live live find all references. So if you if that's something that's interesting to you as you're working to see all the calls. Uh, to a particular type, uh, you can um, you can get that a type or a uh, identifier. Um, one thing when live sync is is active, if you're on a primitive type, you can press. Uh, it won't show you those references by default because it's expecting those to be both uninteresting and uh, possibly existing in huge amounts. So for primitive types, we will not show that to you by default, but we can just click down here or press Shift F12 to see all of them within the solution. So here we can see all the strings in the solution. And back in the tool windows. And the unit test runner. So the unit test runner is, uh, is a beautiful piece of technology. Um, the, the, there are like two things that distinguish this test runner from any other test runner out there, including the test runner that comes in Visual Studio. 
One is the ability to run and debug a single Silverlight test case, which uh, right now this is the only unit test runner that can do it. And the second thing that this that this test runner can do, which is is is, is really beautiful, is if you have test cases spread across multiple assemblies, it can run those tests in parallel. And as a result, it's the test run speed is about is is about a third or can be up to a third of what the speed is, or I'm sorry, not the speed, the time is about a third of what it is for competing test runners. So it can it can it can finish your test run in about a third of the time. So that's the test runner. And with that, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, and it looks like I'm not seeing any, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait just a minute. But if there are any other questions, we will uh, answer those. And if not, we will uh, we'll wrap it up. Um, we've just had one more question come in that uh, asks if you're able to say a little about um, setting how much or how little you want how much or how little code rush of code rush someone might want to see? Right. Is there so a way the, to modify it? There are ways to modify it. So one of the ways to modify it is with this toolbar right here. So for example, I turned on uh, code issues, but you can turn that off. Um, the spell checker is turned on, but I can turn that off as well. Member icons, that's what they look like off to the side. These are useful if you want to, like, for example, move these to a region, for example. Um, what else? Uh, flow break, flow break icons. These are useful if you have complex code. Um, that is, uh, um, I was just looking for some, but we don't have any inside here. But if you have complex code, for example, if I put this inside of a uh, try finally block, let me show the test for the code uh, training window. Notice as I make a selection, the coder's training window says I can type in F for a try finally. So I come over here and I, I type in F for a try finally. And now down here I might have some more code. Actually, let's create a, a quick for loop here. And and inside the for loop we'll say like if true, then we'll type in break, and we'll do else uh, continue like that. And let's put all of this um, inside a, of, a, of a while loop while I uh, equals zero like that. So now this is where flow break evaluation is useful. So now when I do a break here, it shows you where the next bit of code is going to be. If I do a continue here, it shows you where that's going to be. If I do a return here, it shows you where the code's going to flow to. So those are um, the flow break indicators. Um, we can show metrics as well. If I click on this next to each member, we'll see a metric. And uh, this is maintenance complexity, but you can choose line count, cyclomatic complexity, or download plugins that give you other metrics. And uh, what else is this? What is interesting? Region painting. Um, I'll show you that real quickly too as well. So, so here we've just created a region around this. We've got region painting turned off, but if we turn it on, what will happen is you'll see the regions painted in this special way. And the right margin line, we can specify that if we want. Line highlighter as well. Um, comment painter, XML doc comments, um, these sort of things. So all of these things you can turn on and off with these buttons here. So that takes care of part of that answer to the question. And then the second answer to the question is with regard to the pop-ups for the um, for the arrows and the other hints. Those are in the options pages that I showed earlier inside of this session when I was talking about disabling the hints. So yes, you can totally configure how much of code rush you see or do not see. Excellent, thank you very much. And um, possibly one for Gary. Is there a template for XIF singleton classes, please? Uh, there is not at the moment. Um, that's, that is um, an interesting point, actually. The, the fact that Code Rush allows you to write your own templates. I mean, if you want a template and it's not shipped with XCF out of the box, then of course you can either do one of two things. You can feel free to write it yourself and then make it available to other XCF um, users in the community, or you can send myself an email at garys at devexpress.com or indeed Mark and actually re request mm -hmm. it. And these templates um, can find their way in, into the product. I mean, the templates there for XCF as they stand were there because we got fed up typing uh, what we had to do. So. Um, and that's and that's how templates are created by by developers out in, in the real world. They find a piece of boilerplate code that they're writing over and over again, and they write a template for it. And that's what we did for XAF, and it's made its way into the to the product. 
And so if you find yourself writing XAF boilerplate code of some description over and over again, and there's no template for it, then either feel free to write one or um, send an email to myself and um, I'll write it and get it included. You know, I'm thinking we, what would be good is we could do this singleton class as a template. Um, I am not familiar enough with XAF right now, Gary, to be able to do this by myself, so I need a little bit of training and see, just show me what a singleton class looks like. Yeah, that's no, that's no problem. If you, in fact, if you do that, I can do this now. I know, I know you've got to step out in a few minutes, Gary. But I, I do. Have, I I don't think we've got the time to get into it right now because I've got to I've got to run away. I'm afraid I've got a okay. parent teachers so, um, conference, so but we can. So let's do this as follow up. Let's you and I will work on a blog post that will either go out on my blog or yours, and we'll both sure. tweet about it, and uh, that will talk about in it. We'll have a, a the list of XAF templates and a description of them, and we'll also have. Uh, uh, a response to this question about the XAF Singleton class. My sense is it shouldn't be too hard to create a template to get you what you need, and uh, and then we can export that and have that be a link on the blog post. Okay, works for okay. me. Okay. All right. Anything else? Are we done, Rachel? I think that is all of the questions. Um, there doesn't appear to be um, anything else coming in at the moment. So whilst we've got a few moments for people to think about things, um, that they might want to ask. I will just mention a couple of things. Um, those of you who, who haven't already downloaded it or been to the website or noticed, um, DevExpress DXperience version 10.2 is now available for download. You can get it from your download manager at devexpress.com. Um, following this webinar, we do have another one this week. It's on Thursday the 16th of December and that will be with Seth Juarez, and that is the end user report designer, um, in which Seth will be tackling the ins and outs of implementing the report designer in WinForms applications. Um, so do join us for that um, if it's something that you're interested in. And just before the holidays, there will be another two webinars, one on Monday, December the 21st, which will be an introduction to data access and customization with the Silverlight Grid, and also another on Tuesday, December 22nd, which is working with selections and the clipboard in CodeRush. So if you miss anything from this webinar or any of the previous webinars that we've run, um, remember you can see them again. They are all recorded and they are available on the DevExpress channel at tv.devexpress.com. Um, and I think that's just about it. So unless anybody else has any questions, um, I think we're good to wrap up for today. Oh, there's one more. Is it coming? We've got some time. <laughs> Rachel, I see. I just noticed a question from Jose um, from earlier this morning. He asked, "Is there a way to set the setter method public?" And there was, and then he did follow that up with, "Instead of it being protected." And then Gary answered it. But if you've got more, oh, to he add did. Answer, then oh, okay. So the, the only thing I was going to going to add on to that is is let me get to a point where I've got a uh, uh, like for example here we've got this log uh, method right here. So there's so Gary's answer. What was Gary's answer to that? Um, let me see what, the, what Gary said. Well, basically, I said if you wanted if you wanted the um, if you wanted this to be a sort of permanent behavior, then you can um, change the template. I see. Change the templates. Okay. So that so so that was Gary's answer. So in addition to changing the templates, that's one of the things you can do. You can also cycle visibility of a particular member. Uh, very easily. If you have your hands on the mouse and you want to, and you have the member icon selected, you can just click it and change the visibility in that way. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is use uh, Alt up and down. So Alt plus up or Alt plus down with that, and that will change the visibility. Just cycle through all the visibilities like that. They're available. So Alt up and Alt down goes I mean, up plus and Alt down. To cycle back around. Okay, so that is a way that you can change visibility. And was there was there another one that came in, Rachel, or no? Um, there there was the beginnings of one, but um, the person never completed the end of the sentence. Perhaps he just wanted to say hello. I'm not sure. Um, okay. But it doesn't look like there is anything else. So um, I think we should thank Gary, thank Mark um, for their. Um, 
preparedness for their webinar and this will be available on the Dev Express channel um, in the coming days so please do look out for it if you want to review it for any information and I think that all that is left to say as Amanda would say is thank you very much for joining us and thank you very much for choosing Dev Express.